Good evening. Welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Scott Schaefer. Tonight, we're going to talk about drought burnout, water wasters, and grass. The kind you mow, not the kind you smoke. And later in the show, we're also going to talk about school funding and reforming teacher tenure with the state school's chief. But first, let's talk about lawns. Ever wonder how a state with millions of acres of desert ended up with so many green lawns? Well, the answer, in part, has to do with nostalgia. Sally Taylor lives in the shadow of Mount Tamalpais. She can identify the types of birds and hawks that fly by and point out the native plants that grow on her five acres. Madrones I love, they've all come up in recent years, and that to me is a tremendous compliment because madrones don't like people in houses. So if a madrone grows, you feel that you're doing things right. She spends much of her free time in her garden, as her mother once did. My mother, who had a house on this same ridge and who came from the east, was determined to put an eastern garden on a California hillside, and she did so. So we had three lawns, two of which were very large indeed. But with no end in sight to the drought, Taylor is breaking with tradition. She's gotten rid of her lawn. Like many Californians, lawns themselves were East Coast transplants. This is Levittown, Pennsylvania a new suburban community. After World War II, when home ownership became a symbol of middle-class achievement, lawns were a key feature in new housing developments. So all the houses are very much the same, and it's patriotic. We just came back from the war, and now it's embedded in our culture that we are taking care of each other by keeping our neighborhood looking the same. Everybody had to keep their lawn a certain length, and weed free, if you didn't, there you would be either ostracized or at least get some dirty looks from your neighbors. Sarah Sutton is a landscape architect and the author of The New American Front Yard. She says Levittown developers saw grass as an instant just add water landscape and included a free year of lawn care in the price of every home. Sutton says as more people headed west, they looked for homes with green lawns, even in the desert. Ironically, it was drought mitigation efforts that began in the early 20th century that allowed grass to grow in arid climates. Drought is a grave national problem, correcting it a mammoth undertaking. When those mammoth water projects were completed, water seemed abundant and lawns became a staple of the American West. This would never have happened without the Hetch Hetchy, without the Owens Valley, without taking the water uh, to allow us to have an oasis where it really shouldn't have been allowed to happen. Today I'm declaring a drought emergency in the state of California. Uh, we are in a uh, unprecedented, very serious situation and people should uh, uh, pause and reflect on how dependent we are on the rain, on nature, and one another. For Ken Honeycutt, that reflection led to a change. Before, uh, before we started, this was just an just tire, just open lawn like the next door neighbor's was. The retired truck driver says the drought pushed him and his wife to pull up the front lawn in front of their San Lorenzo home. And trust me, coming out to mow it once every two weeks was not a chore that I, that I liked doing after a while. We wanted to have a front yard that was, was pleasant and, and colorful and in the process of doing so, the creek bed came into play when we realized we could do a recirculating creek bed. Honeycutt took advantage of an incentive program offered by the East Bay Municipal Utility District. The program pays for some of the costs of replacing grass lawns with more drought resistant landscapes. Trading their lawn for a water smart landscape, he gets those savings not just today and tomorrow, but for years to come. Honeycutt received a little more than $500 from his water district, a tiny fraction of what it cost to redo his yard. Water districts around the state have been offering rebate programs for years, paid for by state grants and ratepayers. Since the drought began, Bay Area water districts say they've seen a sharp rise in businesses and homeowners taking advantage of these lawn replacement programs. Right now during this drought, we rely on both conservation and also on extra water supplies to get us through this really difficult season. And so those extra supplies from the Sacramento River are very expensive. And so conservation helps keep everybody's costs down. 
Sutton, the landscape architect, says the drought is giving Californians a chance to rethink the water-guzzling traditional front lawn. Uh, now, come on. Come on. Sally Taylor is now one of a growing number of Californians turning to artificial lawns. I was shocked at the contemplation of it. I never thought that I would have an artificial lawn. I thought that it was really very wicked and immoral. <laughs> but the drought prompted a change of heart. If it hadn't been a drought, I doubt I would have. But it is, and we don't know how long it will go on. Taylor has made peace with her decision. It was so perfect when it went in that it frightened me. I had the feeling that I ought to spray paint all the stuff behind it with green paint to make it look as good as the lawn because I've never had a lawn that looked as good as this lawn, <laughs> which made me kind of nervous. No, it took some getting used to, but I don't regret it. Ken Honeycutt says he couldn't be happier with his choice. It, it, it's nice. The nature is so important, and, and in a city environment, you, don't, you just don't get you don't get it as much as, you, as you'd like to. And any additional birds and, and hummingbirds and bees, and so I, I imagine they're coming for, for the, hopefully for the plants. Hopefully we did a good job <laughs> making their environment better. I mean, I, I would you'd like to think so. Lawns throughout California are going to get a lot browner as the drought continues. Next week, state mandates take effect, requiring water districts to cut usage, in some cases, as much as 36%. Paul Rogers, managing editor for KQED Science and environment writer for the San Jose Mercury News is here to talk about how these cuts may alter the state's landscape, literally and figuratively, Paul, right? Yes. Well, did you ever think uh, that you'd be spending this much time talking about people's lawns? Well, you know, uh, the drought is kind of like an earthquake. It's a natural disaster, and we need a quick response because in many places, we're running out of water. And so the lawn is where 50% of the water is in terms of residential use in California. It's the low-hanging fruit. It's the easiest place to get the most savings. And as we see the governor's mandates uh, hitting all these different cities who are facing fines of up to $10,000 a day if they don't meet their targets, a lot a lot of cities around the state are expanding programs to buy back uh, people's lawns and to pay them to tear out their grass and put in drought tolerant plants. I mean, just this week, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which has 19 million customers, it's the biggest water district in California, they announced they're going to spend $350 million, a third of a billion dollars, paying people $2 a square foot to rip out their grass. That's going to save a lot of water, and they have 60,000 people on a waiting list right now. So, is that, and that's going to be an incentive? for really wealthy people in Beverly Hills, you think? Anybody. The wealthy people generally use the most water. They have the biggest yards and they can afford to pay the highest bills. So it doesn't really matter who's using the water. You want to get rid of that grass. Other than financial incentive and threats, yeah. uh, what works to motivate people? What have we found in, in other droughts that really you know, gets people to change their behavior? Well, one thing is just the public understanding how serious this is. You know, This is the worst drought in the 164 year history of California as a state. Our snowpack is at 5% of normal. The rainfall in most places is half over the last four years of what it should be. We don't know if we're in the fourth year of a four-year drought or the fourth year of a 10-year drought. Australia just had a drought that lasted 12 years. So any water that we don't pour on our grass right now is water we can drink next year or the year after or the year after, or it's water we can put out fires with, we can give to hospitals, we can run the sewer lines with. This is serious and we don't have the luxury of big green lawns anymore. But you know, we've looked at some of the statistics, people save water and then they kind of slide yeah. back. You get this kind of a drought fatigue or burnout yeah. that happens. How can water districts, the governor, anybody else uh, combat that? The good news is a lot of these savings, whether it's replacing your lawn or putting in low flow appliances, they lock in the lower demand forever. You know, if you ex if you switch out your old six gallon per flush toilet with a new 1.2 gallon per flush toilet, when it starts raining again in a year or two or three years, you're not going to go and tear the new toilet out and put the old one back in. And the good news is what, what that has meant is that over the last 30 years, uh, big cities like L.A., San Jose, San Diego, San Francisco, they're using as much, if not less, water now than they were 30 years ago, despite the population growth. And there's a lot more low-hanging fruit. These lawns, uh, there's a lot of old appliances. When you replace this stuff, you actually are shrinking the water footprint, which is really important. It is important. Of course, people are paying a lot of attention, keeping an eye on their neighbor's water use as well. The Santa Clara Valley Water District says it's hiring more people to handle all the calls it's getting at its drought hotline. 
The district has a team of inspectors looking for water waste. Dan Steiner, a student at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism, spent some time with one member of that team. I do not like being called a water cop. I am a water waste inspector. To me, a cop is somebody who enforces the laws and stuff. I, we don't do that. We inform, we educate. So I am a water waste inspector, not a water cop. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I respond to about 10 to 15 cases uh, a day. Most of the cases are uh, excessive water runoff, uh, broken irrigation, and uh, water in within restricted hours. Once we get to the location, we look to see if we see anything. So if somebody calls in and said that they're watering their car without a shutoff nozzle, we'll look to see on their water hose if they have a, a positive shutoff nozzle. Then we'll go to the door, knock on the door, try to make contact with the customer. And um, if not, then we leave a door hanger. The destination is on your phone. We also like to check to see, uh, you know, as you can see, their, their lawn is pretty healthy. So we see that they're definitely watering. And we just hope that they're watering within the restricted hours. So let's go see if we can get to So nobody's home, doesn't look like anybody's home. So what I'm gonna do now is just uh, indicate what the violation was. So I'm just gonna mark down that they were watering within the restricted hours of 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, yeah, pretty much. We have a big county almost 2 million residents. So there's a lot of reports that are coming in about water waste. Oftentimes people don't even know that uh, the sprinklers go off at five in the morning and maybe they just aren't around at that time. Maybe they don't go outside to see that they've got a gusher. Some people certainly won't take this seriously until there are fines being issued. But I think most people wanna do the right thing. So it's actually right here, okay. And so uh, somebody reported about the irrigation system out here it was being used at um, during a uh, water restricted hour. So I was just trying to get information on either like the property manager or uh, facilities manager or so anybody that's in charge of your irrigation system. No, okay. I'm just the shift supervisor. Okay, no problem. <laughs> now what a moisture meter does, this pretty much can tell if you're overwatering your grass. So what you, what you do is plug it in like it says this is wet. So this is completely unacceptable. So we definitely we need to get in touch with the um, with the person responsible for irrigating. We're going to uh, Silver Creek Country Clubs. Now this is actually going to be the second time that I went out to this address and apparently he has not gotten this fixed. So I would definitely make note of it. So the last time, so it still looks like he's still having that same problem. It's a broken, broken sprinkler heads and it's causing all this flooding right here. And you can see right here. Okay. Normally, the, the biggest fights are over the phone is after I left the door hanger and they'll call back and again, they're, they're upset because they don't really understand what the door hanger means. They just see the notice and they just want to know how much is the fine going to be and they want to fight the case and I'm like, it's not a case to fight. It's just stop wasting water and we won't have a, you won't ever see me again. Hello. How you doing? I'm from the uh, Santa Clara Valley Water District. I'm uh, hearing about the, um, the excess runoff you have right here in front of your home. Excuse me? I'm sorry, I can't. You can just leave it on the door. I will just leave it on the door, okay? okay. Thank you. If my job security 
is depending on this drought, the way it's looking, I'll probably be here for a while. And Paul Rogers, as we saw right there, uh, not everyone is complying or answering the door, fixing their broken sprinklers. So what then? Well, uh, it's not a good idea to ignore this guy, basically. <laughs> uh, the, the, the water district is the wholesale water provider for two million people in Santa Clara County. They don't send you the bill. There's uh, 13 retailers, the cities and private water companies that send you the bill. And what they're doing at the district is they're keeping a list of everybody who gets these tags. And if you have two or three of them, basically, they then report you to the city or to the water company, in this case, the San Jose Water Company. Uh, and those guys uh, can either fine you. Uh, San, the city of San Jose can fine you $160 for violating these kind of rules. Sacramento, they're fining people up to $1,000 for watering on the wrong day. Uh, or uh, the other thing they can do, which is quite interesting, is put a flow restrictor on your meter. Uh, the San Jose Water Company is saying after one warning that they get from these kind of guys, they're going to start slapping these things, which are like the boot that you put on a car, <laughs> right? You know, if you haven't paid your tickets. So like it or not, you're going to use Right, and it'll water. stop the, not stop, but it'll reduce the flow yeah, going yeah, into your house. Yeah. So you, you don't ignore this guy. There's a lot of interest in water wasters and water shaming. Yeah. Uh, is there a list? Will there be a list? I mean, if the media want to know who are the top 10 water wasters in Santa Clara County, will that list be available? Uh, unfortunately not. Um, the, way that, um, the way that the laws are written in California, um, the individual water usage by home and by business is not public information any more than your PG&E bill is. The only thing you can get is if you have a public agency like a city, uh, you can actually find out as a reporter how much water the individual city council members use if they are sending public water officials. Yeah. yeah, and some people have begun to look at that stuff. And what we found is that, you know, there's some city councilmen in Riverside and places like that with giant yeah. green lawns and they're imposing rules on everybody else. But for the most part, um, there's not any really yeah. egregious cases I know of. Let's talk about the weather for a minute. Yes. We're seeing Texas getting all this rain yeah. flooding everywhere. They were in a terrible drought. What, if anything, does that mean for us here in California? And how much water have they gotten? Well, um, to put the Texas thing in, in perspective, uh, San, Jose, San Jose got 13 inches of rain in the last 12 months. San Francisco's had about 20, LA's had eight. Houston had 11 inches. Uh, on Tuesday night in wow. 24 hours. Wow. So basically a year's supply in one night. Um, there's a question over whether this is related to El Nino. Um, there are El Nino conditions in the Pacific right now. The stronger that El Ninos are historically in California, the more rain we get. We had one last year, but it fizzled out. The water in the ocean was warm. It didn't connect with the atmosphere to change the jet stream and bring storms. This year, so far, the, it is connecting with the atmosphere, and a lot of scientists aren't quite ready to say it's certain we're going to have an El Nino but it's looking more and more likely. So uh, that's a good sign. Yeah, you know, it's always frustrating to me when you get a good storm and then everybody says, well, that didn't do anything to solve the drought. Right. Is it possible that a really wet year like we're seeing in Texas, could that solve our drought in a single year? Yeah, it, it's a great question, and it could make a big dent in it. There's, there's really, um, you know, sort of three things you need to fill up. You need to fill up the streams first to help the wildlife, and that, help, that comes pretty quickly after storms. Then you need to fill up the reservoirs. That takes a lot longer. Longer. But with one good wet year, you can do that. The last one we're not going to fill up in one year is the groundwater, all this overpumped groundwater. But we don't even know how much has been taken out. That's right. And uh, some of these places, like in the Central Valley, it's going to be 50 years before it's filled back up again. But, you know, if we had a really good wet year like 1997, we got to be careful because you have mudslides, people die in floods. We don't want too much. But a good soaking wet, like 150% year, that would largely end the drought. But we just don't need another dry spell after that. We need a couple of normal years, so fingers crossed. If you think about the psychology of that, though, does, that, does everyone just go back to planting their lawns and you know doing washing their cars and all that? No, that's the good thing about all these lawn programs and the low flush toilet programs. Once it's in, it's in. It's like if you put a uh, an LED bulb in your in your house and all the fixtures. You never go back and put the old crummy bulbs back in again, right? You get those savings forever. And, or if you buy a hybrid car, you don't one day say, you know, I think I'll go buy a used Humvee. Uh, you, you, you keep that savings. Efficiencies are good. And what happens with every drought is California becomes more efficient and laws begin to change. That's what we're starting to see now. The lasting impacts from this drought will be not only lawns removed, but uh, we've had reform in groundwater rules. We're starting to require farmers to measure it and, and rural places to measure it. And we passed the $7.5 billion water bond in November. That will spend uh, a lot of money for things like new reservoirs, water recycling, uh, even desalination. Just a few seconds left, Paul, but if 
that doesn't happen, if we don't get a lot of rain, are we facing some tough decisions in California? And what might one or two of those decisions be? Well, uh, absolutely. We're going to be looking at severe forest fires this summer and beyond if we don't get more rain. And we're also going to be taking water from farmers. Uh, right now... And that's already happened, yeah, right? Yeah, it's going to be a much more severe uh, taking. Uh, farmers who have senior rights, going back to the 1800s, are going to lose their water. Because in the end, we've got 38 million people, and you cannot grow cotton and rice in the desert and say, uh, we're running out of water for Los Angeles and for the Bay Area. Something's got to give. All right, Paul let's Rogers. Let's hope it's El Nino. <laughs> let's hope it is. Paul Rogers, Managing Editor for Science here at KQED and Environment Writer for the San Jose Mercury News. Always good to see you. Thank you. It is graduation season, and it's also the season for putting together the state budget. This year, the state has a big revenue surplus. California schools could get more than $7 billion in additional funding. Joining me now to discuss how that money might be spent is Tom Torlakson. He's the state superintendent of public instruction. Good to have you with us. Great to be here, Scott. Well, as you well know, California has a new formula for deciding how much money school districts get, and it's intended to help uh, districts that have a lot of low income, foster care kids, English learners. Um, and yet there's been studies that show that in the first rounds of that funding, it isn't really getting to the students that it's intended to help. How is the state going to make sure that it does? Well, we have a, a system of checks and balances with the county superintendents and my office ultimately making sure that that does happen. I believe it is happening for the greatest part uh, that the money is going towards the students that need it the most, kids from poverty, English learners, foster kids. Uh, and we're also seeing, again, the chance with the budget growth to invest across the board in programs that are really exciting and meaningful. Like what? What's an example of a program that this kind of money will really help, uh, you know, launch? Career technical education. We used to call it vocational education. Just yesterday I announced $70 million in the Bay Area. Rich partnerships between schools, high schools, community colleges, universities. Students are getting hands-on learning. It's learning with a purpose. It's critical thinking, problem solving. It may be in the field of computers. It may be in the field of engineering. It may be in the field of healthcare. But students are motivated. Their graduation rate in these programs is 95%. At the same time, we have this persistent achievement gap for many yes. years in California. We're not the only state that sees this, but uh, white, Asian, high-income students doing much better on standardized mm -hmm. tests and graduation than mm -hmm. African-American and Latino students, st kids who come from low-income families. How are you going to close that gap? What are you doing? Well, part of it is the new state law that targets the funds. The, the new law you spoke of targets it towards the kids of greatest need. So that'll help. We have been narrowing the achievement gap. It's too slow. We need to do more. Uh, we've done legislation. I actually wrote legislation for after school programs to tar target the lowest 20% of schools in performance with extra money for after school programs. We did the same thing on a quality investment act for California and it worked really well. The test scores went up, uh, minority students went up faster than the, the norm of the regular students. So we're going to invest in these students, get them motivated. We also need to close the digital divide. A lot of the learning taking place in school now is done digitally and through the internet, and there's a digital divide. And Although there's some debate, isn't there, about how much technology there really should be in the schools? I think it's a game changer for the better. I really think it's, it's going to make a huge difference. Students can pace themselves. They can be right where their skills are, and the computer guides them step by step to higher proficiency. So that's a, a game changer and will also help close the achievement gap. We're putting in about $2 billion in the budgets to invest in more computers and internet access for our kids. I think everyone agrees that uh, great teachers are really mm -hmm. what make the most difference. I know you were a teacher yes. uh, once upon a time. Uh, and last year, there was a judge uh, down in uh, Los Angeles who ruled that the teacher tenure system, mm -hmm. uh, you know, last hired, mm -hmm. first fired, does not work, and that it makes it very difficult to get rid of what he described as grossly uh, ineffective teachers. You're appealing, mm -hmm. the state is appealing sure. that decision. Tell me, tell me why. Well, I think the judge got it wrong in his analysis, and so on an appeals process, I think it'll be overturned. But nonetheless, the goal is to well, get how the did best he get it wrong? Like, wh where is it? Where did he go wrong? Saying that there's a causal effect, and that there are certain groups of teachers that are uh, creating an environment where students aren't able to learn as well as they should otherwise, and there's no real solid evidence or proof of that, in my opinion. I think. At the same time, we need to deal with ineffective teachers, and there are exciting programs we put together to get teachers the professional development they need and to set benchmarks. If they don't meet 
those benchmarks of improvement, they're moved out of the profession. Yeah, I think with what, what, the, what the plaintiffs honed in on, those low-income mm -hmm. kids, the kind of kids mm -hmm. that we're trying to help with this new funding formula, they honed in on that tenure after two years system. Mm -hmm. It makes mm -hmm. it all very difficult to get rid of a teacher who is not performing well. Uh, why is that, what, what's the upside of a system of, of really locking in uh, a teacher after two years? Well, I think what's happening, originally uh, administrators in schools went from a three-year tenure in California and pushed for the two-year tenure because they wanted to be able to get rid of bad teachers earlier in the process. And so now administrators who are skilled in personnel matters, uh, they look at the candidates for teachers and instead of making them permanent or giving them a long-term commitment, uh, they will say, you're not fit for the profession right at the second year of of the tenure process. Do you think there need to be additional changes to the oh, tenure yes, system? Oh yes, and we're, we're working on that right now. In fact, again, uh, just recently we had a labor management conference on how to deal with evaluating teachers and moving the ones that are better up and moving the yeah. ones that are not performing out. If you look at how voters feel, there was the mm -hmm. USC, LA Times poll, and very few mm -hmm. people support the tenure system. 83% um, I think supported mm -hmm. uh, making it more easy mm -hmm. to get rid of ineffective teachers. Now I know that mm -hmm. teachers hate being made scapegoats and they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm wondering, is there a risk of the people with our direct democracy system going to the ballot with mm -hmm. something that could be even more draconian than what you or the union wants to support? Well, I think, first of all, I've supported and strongly supported laws to make it easier to get rid of ineffective and bad teachers. So that's, that's a given and that's the background. I think when they see the progress we're making in looking at the capacity of the whole teaching workforce and building up the whole capacity to a greater level of effectiveness, that's where, that's where the good news is coming. And I think when the whole story is told, uh, the public will say, you know, this is, this is smart. Yes, there needs to be some reform but uh, we're already working on how to be more effective with our teaching. All workers. right, we're out of time. I yeah. thank you for coming in. Tom Torlakson, Superintendent of Public Instruction for California. Thanks so much. Good to be here, Scott. And that's it for tonight's show. For all of KQED's news coverage, go to kqednews.org. I'm Scott Schaefer. Thanks for joining us.